Josh was talking about his notion set up for Southern Angels, which he's very proud of. <laughs> um, is there any audience Q&A? Throwing the mic to the... Uh, thanks. Uh, it's been uh, some really good insights to everyone and great to see everyone out tonight. Um, there's always a lot of focus on high growth venture scale startups. And I know as a state, that's a big focus for us. Um, there's also a, a sort of a set set of metrics around a company that fits that criteria, um, especially when it's venture backed. It needs to be able to return an amount of capital to those um, VCs over a number of years. It's become um, increasingly easier to start a business and grow a business with the cloud and, and accelerators and so forth, um, which is, you know, many people in this room that I know have been able to create great businesses that I think over the next 10 years can be 30, $50 million businesses. That's not necessarily going to fit the bill of a, a venture back type of company. Um, and I think there's a massive gap in funding for companies that really just need $250,000, $500,000 as a one-off investment to get up and running. Um, what can we do as a startup community to, to fill that gap, um, to give these founders with great ideas who want to build, you know, businesses that are in that sort of, you know, 10, 30, $50 million a year revenue? Because I think as a state, we've got a great track record of building those types of companies. Um, and I think that the more of those we build, the more first-time founders we have who can exit those companies, either through an acquisition uh, through you know, potentially IPOs and then recycle that capital into sort of the next future, second, third generations of a startup community. So any ideas on how we foster that? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I mean, I think that's a, that's a, a sweet spot for the angel investors because quite often we don't look for the really high growth companies because you're just going to be so diluted by you know, large numbers of rounds of venture capital. Um, and you feel like, well, you know, I, what, what influence can I have? I want to help, you know, it's, uh, so angel investment tends to go for a bit more of, the, of a call them the organic uh, companies and perhaps help them achieve that. Um, I, I agree there is still a gap there um, that's uh, hard to address. It's a real, you know, you, you get that three Fs funding and then, you know, you know, you're not at the point for venture capital and then you've got to do all these equations, which you do often quite theoretically about how I'm going to be a 10, 20 times return type company. It ain't the case. I think actually we probably need to put in the Australian environment with the kind of investment funding position we have, which is not like the US, um, more of a focus on companies thinking, how can I actually achieve a bit of cash flow is a good thing to do. Um, so one of the companies I chair, for example, Techsite, um, is uh, already, it's only two years old, so it's already generating half a million per annum in uh, commercial revenue. We get grants too, we like those, Brendan. Yeah. And, the, and, the and, the and the investors like you to say, well, I'm going to double your funding in a non diluted way. Yes, thank you. So that's great. <laughs> so it's good, but um, generating commercial cash flows. Um, a slight deviation, only slight, from what its ultimate growth strategy will be. But having that cash flow, particularly in this environment, is one hell of a protective factor and I think a positive for investors. So some of those sorts of business strategies uh, and also the types of investors, but I think we, we have a gap that way. Um, in somewhere a bit between the, the, the full-scale venture capital and the angel, uh, the, the Uniseed fund that I'm on the board of is, unfortunately, we don't have it in South Australia, which is a bit of a gripe of mine, but they have, they, they have members of four universities on the East, East Coast plus CSIRO, and they invest for those entities, spin-outs from those companies. And it's a bit of a hybrid. So, for example, it's not a closed fund because that's a, the kind of company you're talking about, one of the deadly things is a closed-end fund you know, a 10-year closed fund. Oh, sorry, and this happened to me in TGI Biosciences. We had a, a very friendly venture capital investor, but he invested in us at year five of his 10-year fund. And he thought he was going to get an extension. And then we hit uh, the global financial crisis and all the investors, super funds and things said, we're out of this game. Sorry, you have to sell this company. So we were forced to end up selling TGI Biosciences a management buyout for a song which stuffed a whole lot of the original investors because of that. It turned, it, it turned around and grew, as I said, in this, in this assay kit area and it's been very successful. But a tough 
thing for a company to face when you're at that phase where uh, Uniseed is uh, not a closed end fund and provides a little bit more of that between angels and venture capital of, uh, of uh, nurturing of, of early stage, invest a bit earlier than what venture ca capital would do. So I think we need more of those funds. Uh, we don't have the full breadth of things that, so you know, what you say is a real problem. Mm. I, I agree with your observations. The, um, the SA Venture Fund was set up to solve a particular problem. There was a, an, an observation a few years ago that within that high risk, high return, many startups fail, but some take over the world place. There were not enough people in South Australia investing. So I believe that's, that's why we exist. Um, but yes, in more mature startup ecosystems around the world, the, the funding options have become a lot more diverse. Um, venture debt's one of the, uh, the first examples, but you know, I've heard about funds that will, you know, if you're in the consumer or the SaaS space, they'll specifically fund customer acquisition. If you can come to them with a year or two of cohort data that says for every $10 we spend on marketing, we pay that back in nine months, 10 months, 12 months, th they will fund just that marketing budget for you and take a, a percentage maybe of the new revenue or, or this or that. These are, these are more mature market funding options, but um, they exist and you know, potentially folks in Adelaide could copy and paste that idea. Um, but um, you know, we're, we're, Again, we're, we're happy to have those conversations and try and point people in those directions if we think it's right. Judy? I, I think the, the point I'd make is, and we heard this before from the floor, I think the question was, where are the, where are the angel investors? We can't find them. And I think you'll probably hear invest, angel investors say, well, where are the startups? We can't find them. So to some extent, there's a, an opportunity to organize yourselves in a network that's a little bit more active if you're in that cohort of startups that are not really going to be a venture investable business but are possibly an angel investor type business that might give a 3x return or have some other way of, of paying back investors it might be an earn out through dividend whatever the structure might be there's different structures but often it's having that portfolio that people can look at and say, here's something I can invest in. Just a thought. Before we go to the next question, Michael Macalino is the Associate Director of AgTech at BDO, if you want to talk to him later. Um, there you go. Just thought I would introduce our questions. Uh, now we have a question. Do you want to say your name, your role, your company? Thanks, Daniel. Daniel Polaris, Director Polaris Legal. And my question's for David. When you return to Australia to start up Uber here, I understand ride-sharing services were still unlawful then. It seems quite a significant challenge to overcome. And my question is, what was your strategy to overcome the challenge? And what advice would you have for startups facing similar challenges? Um. Yeah, winding the clock back. I, I came back in 2012 and um, as, I was, as I was winding up at Uber, I actually dug out my old Excel spreadsheets that I put together where I calculated what did I think the size of the market was in Sydney and what might this become. And, and I got to a number that was wrong by a factor of 50. Um, and the, the company I joined at that time was just the luxury product, Uber Black, um, which it still exists today, but it's a more expensive option to, to taxi. So therefore, not, not for everybody. Ride sharing came a couple of years later. The, the core ingredient in everything that we were able to achieve was it was a product that the customers were really passionate about. And at some point, um, when there were decisions being made in government, we might ask them, hey, if you've got an opinion on this topic, here's the email address for your local member. Um, please have your voice heard. They only did that because they were really, really happy about what they were using. It helped that they were grumpy about the prior alternative. So there was quite a, quite a lot of passion in that, but we had nothing without customers that were on board with what we wanted to do. But the company was born at the right time because we, you know, because it was a, um, you know, a location-based service, we had some sense for who your local member of parliament was. Twitter was a thing. So you could just press one button and start tweeting. And so social media suddenly was, was, uh, you know, capturing their attention. So we had the right tools at the right time with the right product. Um, but as far as repeatable lessons, it's just, you know, your customers will be your voice. That was, that's the only reason it worked.
before I hand over the mic, I do encourage you all to, to make yourself known to others, um, to our panelists here tonight, to the previous panel and have fun and enjoy human company in real life.